<clears throat> All right, let's continue. We have one more lesson we're going to do from page 1126 of chemistry. And that's looking at ionic equations on page V. Notice questions 92, 93, and 94 at the bottom of the page use this information here, this one directions. It says, answer the following questions regarding the reaction of mercury, Roman numeral 2, chloride. So remember, the Roman numeral tells us that um, mercury is going to have a positive 2 oxidation number or charge. Of course, chlorine is negative 1. And potassium sulfide. So potassium is K, of course, sulfur, sulfide, negative 2 there. It says, first of all, write a balanced chemical equation. So let's see if we can do this together, because we need to come up with, uh, first of all, putting mercury chloride together with potassium sulfide. <clears throat> So mercury is positive 2, so I'm going to write Hg, and that's going with um, chloride, which is negative 1, which means we have to have 2 of the chlorine to balance, okay, because each one is negative 1, so 2 of the negative 1s balances the positive 2. And now I'm going to add to that potassium sulfide, K, and S. Now sulfur is negative 2, potassium is positive 1, so that means I need 2 of the potassium. Now the question is, what do they become when we react them together? <clears throat> well, this is a double replacement, so I'm going to put the potassium first, doesn't matter, and the chlorine. Now let's see, each potassium is one, each chlorine is one, so I just need one of each, so we're good there. And then that means that the mercury, Hg, and the S, they're both positive one, or positive two and negative two, so I just need one of each and they should go together. And then the question is, what do I need to do to balance the equation? All right, let's see. We have the Hg is balanced, the S is balanced, but we need two of potassium and two of chlorine. So I think we can just put a two in front right there. All right, so basically that gives us the balanced equation for 92. Next thing we're going to look at is the ionic equation. Now, wait a minute. You know what? I forgot to write in here, <clears throat> and this is important. They want us to include the fact that this is aqueous, AQ, and this one is aqueous, AQ. The KCL, but um, all of these should be right after. I just didn't leave enough room. It should be right after the name of them. <clears throat> but I'm wondering about the mercury sulfide, whether that is going to be a solid or whether that's also going to be, a, be dissolved, be aqueous. Well, if we look at this table 6-9 and we get down here near the bottom, we'll notice sulfides are usually insoluble, okay? It gives a few exceptions, but notice mercury, Hg, is not on the list. So we would say that the um, <clears throat> HgS is a solid. So what they do is they put a down arrow next to that in the formula. So it should kind of look like this right after the HgS. And that means a precipitate is coming out. All right, I'm looking at question 93 now. It wants us to write the full ionic equation. And so that means when we dissolve these in water, <clears throat> all of them are dissolved. They're all aqueous. Okay, so I want you to notice, first of all, we the um, mercury has a positive 2, so we write that charge up here next to the mercury. Here we have the AQ. The um, chlor potassium and chloride, we have two of each, remember, 
and the chlorine is a negative one, potassium is a positive one, so we put those charges next to them. We don't have to write a number, and they're all aqueous. And then the sulfur has a charge of negative two, and it's aqueous. So that's the first step that's all on that line. That's why they give you a long line. And then we draw an arrow. Now, the two things that do come together, and we saw that back in 92, is the mercury and the sulfur <clears throat> actually bond together, and they form a solid. Okay, so in the other formula, we showed a down arrow next to it. This means the same thing. A solid is settling out. But the potassium and the chlorine do not bond together when they're in water and form a solid. They just stay dissolved. So that's why we leave them here as ions. So they are ions in the beginning of this equation, okay, here and here. There's still ions in the end of the equation. So in a way, we could just take those out. They're called spectator ions. They're just watching the reaction and not really getting involved in the reaction. So when you get to 94, it's looking for what is the final reaction then. And what you're going to do, are you ready? You're going to, let me get a different um, marker here. You're going to take this and write it first, okay, plus, then you're going to do the sulfur. We're going to leave out the spectator ions, okay, and then that is going to equal, so draw an arrow, and that will be the HGS, will be our final product. So we're just taking out the spectator ions, and whatever is left is your net ionic <clears throat> reaction. All right, let me give you a test tip. Yay! The test tip is you have one problem like this to do on your homework. You have one to do on your checkup. I would highly recommend you practice doing that one on scrap paper before you get your checkup initialed and start doing it and just see if you did it right. Let's ask your supervisor or your parent if you can check it according to the score key and just see if you did it correctly. And then when you actually do the checkup, do it all over again from scratch and from uh, remembering how to do the steps. But here's the tip. Yay! On the self-test and the PACE test, you need to know the title, you know, the term, but you do not have to do an ionic formula, okay? No ionic equations on the self-test or the PACE test. So there, again, this is just trying to expose you to this idea, but you're not gonna have to master this to do on the test.